just being a male gender, you know, as little boys, that we, we are socialized differently, we are conditioned differently, we are programmed differently. For example, a little girl cries, nobody will call her a lesbian, right? But when a little boy cries, somebody will call him a faggot, a sissy, a punk, so forth mm. and so on. Hello, and welcome to Awake at the Wheel. So in today's episode, we're going to be focusing on men's mental health. So obviously, I'm not a man. However, this topic is really important to me because the majority of clients that I work with in my psychotherapy practice are men, um, specifically men who are first responders. So, you know, the, the typical masculine man. And one of the challenges that arises with this demographic is um, stigma surrounding accessing mental health, talking about mental health, or even accepting that mental health challenges can arise. So to help us discuss this topic today, we have a guest. Uh, we have Mark Tuggle joining us from Harlem, New York. He is an author and a men's mental health advocate. Um, he has been featured in many media outlets, such as on the radio and on TV. Um, so Mark, we're so glad to have you here. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you. All right. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what got you into this space, uh, where your interest developed as far as focusing on men's mental health? Well, uh, I'm a person with lived experience. I was uh, clinically diagnosed with anxiety and depression about 29 years ago. And for many, many years, I never talked about it. Um, it was typical coming from my culture and my gender, um, which is why I call the book Cultural Silence. And um, about four years ago, uh, God put this on my spirit to do some writing around my own personal journey with mental health. And I wasn't sure if it was going to be an essay or a haiku or a poem or a play, but I knew I needed to express myself because I was having some dark days and difficult times. So um, I called a friend of mine and he suggested that we consider inviting other men. So it would kind of relieve the burden just me telling my story all by myself. Um, and so we decided to come up with an anthology, you know, so there's uh, the book's called Culture Silence of Wounded Souls. Black Men Speak About Mental Health. It's an intergenerational anthology. There's 30 men from different backgrounds, and they talk about anxiety, depression, isolation, loss, PTSD, stress, trauma, drug misuse, uh, paranoid schizophrenia, suicide ideation, et cetera. Um, and I just wanted to be of service uh, to Black men uh, whose voices are normally left out of the conversation um, publicly, professionally, um, black men tend to be underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Um, there's a lot of challenges around colonialism, imperialism, and racism, the way we have been perceived and treated in society. So I want to make sure that black men have a voice to express themselves unplugged. So what you get in the book, you're not going to get on BET or CNN or Fox News. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. So as far as those cultural factors, I think that that's something um, that I really want to touch on a little bit more. So of course, there's societal factors and external factors, but I think that culture has played a role for so many generations as far as men and their ability to, to speak about their emotions. Um, and you mentioned in your book, there's a lot of different cultures that were involved in, in the writing of this, which is amazing. Um, and I can speak about my background as South Asian. There is a lot of stigma around both men and women talking talking about their mental health. Um, I often make the joke that I don't really think my family understands what I do for a living fully, um, simply because that stigma exists in terms of, you know, really getting down to what's happening. So can you tell us a little bit about some of those cultural factors that maybe uh, you were able to highlight in your book? Well, you mentioned stigma. Stigma is rooted in shame and secrets. Uh, in the Black community, typically, we're taught to not put our business in the street, um, to not air our dirty laundry. What says in the home stays in the home. And so... Um, family and secrets are, are a dangerous combination because if you tell a secret, it can break the family. But if you keep a secret, it can break your spirit. And that was my experience, feeling broken, feeling alone, feeling lost, feeling confused, feeling misunderstood. Um, mental health is a taboo subject. Um, I mean, culturally, up until the 50s, I mean, Black people were not seeking professional help for any of their personal uh, challenges. You know, even even today... When you say mental health, you may not necessarily think of a black male. 
that may not be the first image that comes to your mind. And so mental health sometimes can be a mask for issues around manhood. You know, uh, even today, sometimes we're, we're called a boy when we go someplace publicly. So there's the, there's the stigma of, of gender, the stigma of culture, there's the stigma of um, pride, image, ego. Um, we live in a society where people don't care so much about how you feel, but what, what you do. Like when you meet somebody, the first thing I ask you is, what do you do? So no one will ask you, how do you feel? And when no one asks you how you feel, you can be begin to believe that your feelings are not important. And you just don't talk about them. Okay, so um, I want to ask you, uh, from your experience, from your either lived experience or in talking to people or knowledge of these things, if we look, let's say, at the experience of, uh, let's say, an American black man, and of course there's as many black men as there are in America, there's that, that many experiences. But if we try to sort of think of it as kind of as a group if you think, let's say, from, let's say, early, early uh, 20th century, okay, uh, you know, 1900 and so on up to now, do you see it as, as far as, um, as far as, let's say, being open about challenges, being uh, able to seek access to mental health and so on? Have you seen it as a, up, like, you know, the trajectory has been increasing, it's been getting better, or did it get better, then it got worse? Has it been up and down? What has that trajectory been like for helping black men? Um... That's a loaded question <laughs> because you use the word trajectory and, um, you know, we're not starting at the same spot as everyone else in society. So it's not as if we're climbing a mountain that we created. So, you know, we live in a society where we are not affirmed. We are not loved. We are not respected. We are not valued. We're not honored. So we have to deal with all the racial trauma, the microaggressions, the white body supremacy that uh, Liz Malcolm talks about. So today in 2024, it is still very difficult to get a black man to say, I'm hurting. Those two words you're not going to hear very often. You may hear some, someone say, well, I feel some type of way. Oh, I'm pissed off, right? But to actually take off that mask and become transparent and become vulnerable, which takes a lot of courage, a lot of integrity, um, it, it's so many centuries of unlearning that we have to do. So it's, it's difficult, but I want to be part of the movement where it becomes more normal to talk about how we feel, what we believe, what hurts our heart, so we can begin to heal. Because we are, we are wounded, and we need to heal. So a lot of what you said there, Mark, is and I, I want to be incredibly sensitive here. And of course, understanding that your experience isn't my experience, but just, you know, from an observational standpoint, a lot of what you described there, I think, does generalize to men, um, whether black, white, Asian, whatever the case may be, in terms of being able to um, to feel comfortable, confident, able, equipped, whatever, to uh, acknowledge and talk about their mental health and their emotions. Um, like you mentioned, anger, for example, that's typically one of the things that I see presenting most is anger. But what we know about anger is it can often be masking so many other emotions. Um, so for you, do you think that there is um, overlap and commonality amongst men in general? I do. I do. I mean, I've talked to men from all around the world and mental health um, is a stigma that's connected to our gender. Um, so regardless of whether you were born in Alaska or New Zealand or Brazil or Cuba, just being a male gender, you know, as little boys, that we are socialized differently, we are conditioned differently, we are programmed differently. For example, a little girl cries, nobody will call her a lesbian, right? But when a little boy cries, somebody will call him a faggot, a sissy, a punk, so forth mm. and so on. So just in terms of his gender, the way he is perceived and treated, um, he learns very early on that it's not safe to express emotion that leaves you vulnerable because someone's going to hurt you. They're going to harm you. They're going to judge you. They're going to question your character, your gender, your sexuality. You learn this very early on when you're a boy. Mm -hmm. And it's different for girls. You know, girl, typically they get a hug. Are you okay? What's wrong, baby? You okay? Little boys get blamed for how they're feeling. You must have said something. You must have did something. You get to toughen up. You got to suck up. You got to man up. You get this kind of stuff when you're young. You know, sometimes parents will say, you got to be the man in the house. And you're eight years old. 
<laughs> and you don't want to disappoint your mother. Yeah. So you go up believing that you have to be the man, even though you're still a little boy. Mm-hmm. Little girls don't have to have the same dynamic. It's, it's very different. Yeah, that's such an interesting point that you make that really was a, a light bulb for me that this naturally occurring thing like crying um, that all kids, whether male or female experience is is treated so vastly differently amongst boys and girls. And I would say, again, culture plays a huge role in that as well. Um, as far as, um, you know, what men need in terms of being able to open up, what, what do you think is currently missing? Um, a lot is missing. Uh, I think language is missing. We don't have the emotional literacy that it takes to express the many dimensions of our emotional experience. And so it's not enough just to say I'm pissed off, right? So can, can a man say, I feel insecure? I feel betrayed. I feel sad, you know, because our society kind of labels emotions as positive or negative or good or bad or right or wrong. Emotions tend to have a value judgment that we did not create as men, but we're told very early on as boys that this is not right to say out loud, right? And I'll give an example. Um, when I was a kid, I have six brothers and sisters. I was born and raised in Chicago. My parents took us to see The Wiz uh, when Dorothy... Um, Stephanie Mills was playing um, The Wiz. And um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with The Wiz. <laughs> I saw it okay, as a kid. Okay. I saw so it. Yeah. Stephanie Mills played Dorothy. Stephanie Mills is amazing. And when she sang Home, you know, she reached that crescendo. She has such a powerful voice. She touched my spirit, right? I must have been nine. And I started crying because she touched my spirit. And some of my brothers and sisters started to laugh at me. Now, I don't believe it was malicious. You know, sometimes you just get that sibling, you know, energy that's nervous, uncomfortable. They never see me cry in public. But I learned through therapy that I had developed the fear of being publicly humiliated. And this is what I learned like decades later, right? And so I never felt safe again to cry. Even to this day, I'm 63. I got a baby face. Thank you. <laughs> I, was say, You're 63? <laughs> <laughs> I know i know so even to this day the the you know the fear of being public humiliated the crying in public is not natural it that trauma happened at a very young age and it just goes to show that boys and girls they're not allowed the same grace in the same space to ex- express their emotions so, Orin, I know you want to jump in, but I just want to add something in there just to, to kind of, you know, be a little contrarian here that I think that, yes, I agree with you in North American culture. That is absolutely true. But again, bringing in my experience as a South Asian, I think a lot of Asian cultures, that is true of females as well. Um, so, Orin, I think you and I have joked before um, I'm a bit of a robot, and that does come from the fact that it, it it wasn't culturally acceptable for me to express my emotions. And a lot of the same things that you've said that, you know, if I, I cry, I'm viewed as weak. And if I have any emotion other than happiness or anger, it's unacceptable, culturally speaking. Um, but I would agree that in North American culture, that is especially highlighted with males. Right. And I was going to say, first of all, thanks for referencing The Wiz. Um, every once in a while, I'll put on Facebook, I'll put, uh, can't you feel a brand new day? Um, and that brings tears to my eyes because I saw The Wiz with my brother. He passed away, unfortunately, two years ago. Um, and he's he's also black. Uh, he was adopted. And I just remember my brother and I going to see The Wiz and, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's amazing the power of memory of music. And, you know, and, and I'm thinking right now I'm getting emotional because that was something that connected my brother and I, we didn't connect on that many things. Well, as kids, we connect on so many things, but I remember the whiz just, so for bringing that up, thank you. No one ever references. So I do appreciate that. Um, Mark, first of all, would have never guessed your age. That's okay. That's you know good on you. Um, but I was going to say, you're probably old enough then. Well, you're definitely old enough to remember, uh, do you know the record free to be you and me? Yeah, it was a hippie record that came out in the early 70s, probably. I know my mom had it, but there was a song that was called It's All Right to Cry. 
And the whole premise was, I'm pretty sure it was for boys, but even back then they were trying to get it out because only certain segments of society, you know, so, you know, like the, the, really the hippie side was trying to say back then, you know, again, everything that you're talking about. So it's been around for quite some time. What do you think is sort of impeding society's picking up that message? Because, you know, you're still having to fight to get it out there. What's what's stopping it? I think, uh, you know, we don't really have the models to show us that it's okay to, to not be okay. Uh, sometimes that we don't have people in our families and our neighborhoods, even people that work at school who model um, a humane way of dealing with difficult, unpleasant emotions, you know, and we don't really have the resources, you know, so um, there's, there's some men who want professional help, for example, but they don't have the money, they don't have insurance, they don't have the information, they don't even know where to go, which is another reason why I wanted to focus on resources in my book because it's important to know what to do, where to go, and who to talk to. And sometimes when those questions are not answered, you just kind of like deal with it on your own. So it, it's helpful to have spaces where we can go, and I, I advocate for you know creating your own space, you know, maybe a social media support group, inviting people to your home once a month or once a week and you sit in a circle and you talk. Um, but we need spaces where we can be free to just be ourselves, whether that's a podcast, radio. Um, you don't get it on television, you know, but we do need those spaces where we can just just be present. And it's in your bio, you were saying, I just want to use the words that you use, a um, same gender loving spiritual being, okay, with a strong sense of justice. So um, should I infer that to mean that are you, do you identify as gay, as bisexual, pansexual? What is your, like, well, I, I'm I, get to I self identify as same gender loving because that's a term that was rooted in with the uniqueness of black life and culture. Like, I value the spiritual principles of Kwanzaa, which we just celebrated December 26th to January 1st. And so one of the principles is uh, Kuti Chagulia, which means self-determination. So instead of being defined, named, created, and spoken for by others, we define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. So I value the spirit of autonomy when it comes to identifying myself and not just blindly accepting what society says I should not identify myself. Because on my birth certificate, it says Negro. Right. I am not a Negro. <laughs> There's a movie. I am not your Negro. Right. So that but that's what's on my birth certificate. But that did not come from me or my grandfather. Right. So as a single loving man, I'm attracted to men. But I that's how I identify. So some people call it okay. SGL. So that's the way I see it. OK, so the reason I ask is, um, do you find that, let's say, within uh, among black men, whether it's age whether it's whether they were raised by both parents, whether it's whether they're gay or straight or same gender loving, like, do you find certain groups either are more amenable to what you're promoting or make, uh, you know, they're more resistant? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I live in Harlem and uh, this summer I was on 125th Street, you know, selling my book and talking to people from all walks of life. Um, you know, Harlem is not what it was when I first came here in 86. Um, so I've talked to people from different generations, different orientations, different religious backgrounds. Um, and there's a common theme around um, stigma, around shame, around silence, around image, around manhunt anxiety, not feeling safe, not trusting anyone, wearing that mask, um, around anxiety and depression. We just don't talk about it. You know, we talk about the game, we talk about the weather. We talk about what we're going to have for dinner at night, but we don't talk about how we feel. And that is universal as, you know, it really transcends gender and culture and faith and orientation. But, you know, I self-identify as a black man. That's my moniker. And so that's this book that I've written. It's, it centers black men and mental health. But I've talked to people in the UK and Canada and South Africa, and they tell me that we have the same stories. It's human. And um, so, I mean, but there is a cultural, and by culture, when I say culture, I mean anything that's not biological. So that's, I, I use a very broad term. Um, so, I mean, culture plays such a huge role in how we see ourselves, how we identify, how, we, you know, what, what we think are the norms and everything like that. So um, 
what would you say, let's say, in the last generation or so, culturally speaking, has either made your challenge more difficult or more accessible, easier for you to promote in the last, let's say, generation? Well, um, 29 years ago, I was uh, diagnosed with HIV. And um, I had a friend who lived with the AIDS virus. Um, she suggested that I see a therapist. And at the time, I thought therapy was for rich, crazy white people. <laughs> uh, which is not an uncommon thought. So, <laughs> um, but you know, I was attracted to her spirit and the way she was living and how she had turned her life around. So I was open to her suggestion. My therapist was a uh, female. 26 years old, heterosexual from Bosnia, we were completely opposites. And she said, Mark, I'm here to assist you with the quality of your life. I saw her every Wednesday for three years. And she taught me so much. We never even talked about HIV, right? And so my journey into the space where I'm at now began with my own lived experience, being in therapy, being open to support groups, uh, and then talking to other friends who had similar health challenges, uh, I've seen people come and go. Um, it's amazing I'm still here to tell my story. But um, more and more men are accessing therapy, talking to life coaches, going to support groups, uh, building their own podcasts. When you go on Instagram, you'll, you see people talking openly about mental health every single day. Um, but also you have the other side where only 1% of psychotherapists in the U.S. are black men, Right. Black men die by suicide three times greater black women. Suicide is the third leading cause of death amongst black men between 25 and 34. So we don't really have a balance, right? We don't have a balance emotionally, financially, you know, socially. So there's so much, you know, that we have to do. Um, but I want to be part of that movement where it becomes more and more normal, where we can have these conversations, we can have this dialogue, and we can talk about that wounded soul that needs to heal on the inside. So Mark, I, I love that you brought that up about therapy because that actually touches on one of the main questions that I did have and was having trouble formulating the thought. So that's, that's a perfect segue. Um, you brought up the point that there are, there's a disproportionate number of, let's say black male therapists to support the black male population. Um, so either speaking from your lived experience or your general opinion, um, Tell me your thoughts on the allyship that can exist between, you know, therapists like myself or like Oren working with the black community and still being effective um, because our, our team strives to be culturally competent in, in everything that we do. But at the end of the day, our lived experience may not be the exact same, but that also doesn't detract from our ability to be able to provide robust help. So I guess what my question is, um, kind of twofold. What can therapists do to enhance that that degree of allyship? And then what can people who are accessing therapy do to kind of um, see past the fact that maybe their therapist is different in their experiences, but still able to provide robust, real, genuine help? Well, I mean, I was fortunate that my therapist, like, like I said, we were so opposite culturally and gender, but it yeah. worked out. And, and that's not an mm -hmm. uncommon experience for a black man. You know, you get what you get. And I was so broken. I didn't care whether it was a female mm -hmm. or what, what country she was from or her orientation. I needed somebody to talk to. Like, I, I've known that since I was a kid. Right. So it, it helps when a therapist has worked on their own stuff. Because <laughs> sometimes yeah. that does not happen. You, you have to deal with counter transference. Trust me, I've had some horror stories. Um, so that, that, that helps when the therapist has on their own work, and that they're um, open to, to racial trauma, that they're open to exploring how um, racism uh, impacts the life of a Black man. And you don't have to be Black to have the dialogue. But if that's not a safe space to talk about, then that, it may not be a good fit. Um, I remember having a Latino uh, therapist who was gay identified, and he couldn't accept me identifying as Sandra Lovey, right? He kept mm -hmm. trying to impose his queer identity on me, and that just didn't work. And so after a month, I had to move on because he just didn't, he didn't get that that's not how I see mm -hmm. myself, and I don't have to. So, you know, it, it, it helps to have someone who models, you know, you mentioned cultural competency, that's, that's really important. Um, but then again, you know, every black male therapist is not going to give you what you need, 
Each person has to find out what works for them. Therapy is not a one-size-fits-all solution. And I think sometimes service providers tend to shame men who choose not to engage in therapy, right? It should not be the barometer or litmus test for getting help that you need. But being culturally competent, being racially sensitive, um, being flexible, right? Having the compassion, having the empathy, those are things I think are really important in treating the whole person, a holistic approach to the person who's sitting in front of you. I'm going to take that to another level, slightly different, but very relevant. Um, and Melanie, I've talked about this before, and I say this with a smile because Melanie is a woman, okay? Um, and, but she, and I think she knows where I'm going to go with this, but at least in Canada, I have seen, and we call, I've called it the feminization of psychology. And, and, you know, it's not, not to do with one's sex or gender, but it's, you know, it's just that it's a term that we've used, feminization, you know, feminine, masculine. But the point is, I've had so many patients over the years, male, female, old, young, doesn't matter where they say, my therapist was useless. All she did, and it's usually she, you know, was just sympathize, not even empathize, more about sympathize. And they said, I want more. I want to be challenged. I want to be held accountable. I want to be, you know, be pushed to be the best that I can be as opposed to being coddled and so on. So I'm curious in your own experience when you're looking and I know your first lived experience was with a woman. But when you're looking at and you're trying to advocate getting men into therapy and so on, are you seeing that there may be some issue with whether it's a man or a woman, you're saying kind of imposing their own operating system onto the patient? Or are you seeing that, like, you know, especially when you were dealing with a man, the way to deal with a man may in some cases be different than how you deal with a woman, uh, you know, and sometimes it's the same. So have you seen an issue with the gender of the or the sex of the uh, therapist? I have. I have. And again, everyone's experience is different, but, you know, sometimes... Some men prefer women, you know, for maybe because they didn't have a great relationship with their father, you know. Um, and then you have some men who don't trust men who look like them. Right. So everyone has their own bias, their own prejudice, their own internal demon that they have to kind of like wrestle with sometimes. Um, I don't believe that there's like one model for success when it comes to therapy and social work. And, you know, I have my journey. Everyone has theirs. And you have to find what works for you as an individual, you know. But there are differences around sex and gender. Um, but I think sometimes when, when they get generalized, I don't know how helpful that is. Right. So, I mean, there's studies, there's research. I mean, I know now most of the men that I talk to prefer talking to a black male. That's what they prefer. But then when they get in the office, they realize, oh, maybe this is not the right black male for me. <laughs> so, you know, it, yeah, it, it's, it's a journey. <laughs> it's like Kevin Durant. It's Kevin Durant was with OKC. Then he went to Golden State. Then he went to Brooklyn. Now he's in Phoenix. It's just like, I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> And if I can touch on Oren's point here and, and not to say that I've got it figured out or anything like that, but like I mentioned from the get go, I work with a lot of men. And I think that, um, you know, even though I'm a petite, soft spoken woman, I am able to work quite well with men because, um, I'm, I'm not Im implementing this overly feminized hand holding. Let's talk about just our feelings and imposing a certain agenda you know, onto males. I think that there does need to be a recognition that the way in which therapy, and of course, not to overgeneralize, there's exceptions to everything, but, you know, um, the way in which a female is going to respond to therapy is likely going to be different than the way that, let's say, um, a black man who grew up in a household where feelings weren't acceptable, that psychotherapy needs to look very different. But I think one of the challenges that a lot of men find is that they are walking into a one size fits all cookie cutter type of uh, modality. And that's what puts people off from therapy. I agree. I agree because, you know, we're kind of bombarded, in my opinion, by contemporary feminists, gender theorists, intersectional people, the Me Too movement. You know, there's not much black and male studies going on in college. And so the thought around therapy, social work, mental health, mental wellness, healing tends to be very female dominated in our society. Mm -hmm. And so our voices are pretty much neglected, unheard. And even when a man talks about he, how he feels, he gets labeled as being complaining, being bitchy, being a punk. So it, it's so difficult just to be in a safe space where you feel that you're being heard and that the woman is not telling you to be a man, right? Because you get that when you're a boy already. 
So when you go into a therapist's office and, and the woman has the same type of perspective on manhood and it comes out professionally and you don't know how to deal with that, you may call her a name that's not pleasant. You know what I'm saying? I mean, anything can happen. So it, yeah. it, you're right. It's not a cookie cutter thing, but there are very, very differences between being treated by, by gender. And I think the most the black men I'm talking to now, they really prefer to talk to a black man. So this is this is a great landmine here. And I'm going to try to ask it not too clumsily. And I'm not sure what kind of answer you can provide, but there's so many layers to it, which is, would you agree, first of all, that one of the biggest problems in the last many years, um, let's say among black youth, okay, male youth in particular, is the lack of a male, you know, a, a positive black male role model, whether the father, a coach, a teacher or something like that. OK, um, but that when I talked about trajectories earlier that, you know, in society, there have been trends with, you know, the, the two parent household, for example, um, up until, you know, I guess maybe the 60s, I think it was around 60s, 70s among the black among black, black people was pretty high and then has dropped quite a bit. And people are attributing that or correlating that with a lot of issues we're seeing with, you know, black youth. Do you think that's overly simplistic? Do you think that's unfair? Do you think that is not taking into you know, account other factors? Do you think it's adequate or uh, fair? What would you say about that kind of thinking? Uh, oversimplistic, I know it's oversimplistic, unfair. Again, we don't own the media. So we're not programming the stories. And quite often when you look at a newspaper, you see a black man on the front or the back. Crime and sports. Those are the images that we see every single day. So even though, for example, you have white kids who are using drugs, you don't see them on the news, right? When a black kid's using drugs, he's on the news, he's like this, he's going to jail. So it is a whole different perspective because of the images that we see. So there are white youth who have the same issues that black youth have, but they're treated differently, legally, morally, socially, ethically, et cetera. So that's a really dangerous, that's a really dangerous assumption to make that, that black boys um, struggle with black parents in a way that the other boys don't because other other kids grow up without a parent too but we don't see that story being told well actually I, I don't know at least in Canada I've, I've seen in some cases more and more where they are saying the lack that's what I was trying to say among what your what your sense was among let's say among black youth but I say in general that when we do see single parent households and it's a hot top topic to deal with or a hot button topic where, we, you know, the lack of, let's say, a male role model. Again, now let's take away the color of the skin, just like having that male role model, whether a teacher, coach, parent, okay, that that is one of the issues, you know, that that is kind of like contributing to some of the problems among uh, youth. So if we take out the color, would you say that that is something that you are seeing, that, you know, again, lack of positive male role models? Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you use the word oversimplistic, so I kind of like that. <laughs> Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is a contributing factor. Um, you know, I had a father who was physically present, but was emotionally absent. So you have that dynamic, you know, because he worked 40 hours a day and then he, he had a furniture business. So he was not home. He was not emotionally present. My needs were not being met. So you have that dynamic. Then you have the dynamic of the black boy who has no father. He's never seen his father. never, never met his father. So you have that void. So those are contributing factors, but that's not the only factor. It's not the main factor. Mm -hmm. It is a huge factor. But I don't want to generalize by saying, well, if you don't have a father, you can't be happy, you can't be loving, you can't be kind, because that's not true, right? Because there are mm -hmm. also single parents who are black men, but that image is not being presented. That story is not being told. When you think of a single parent, you automatically think of a female, right? Who put that image into our mind? We didn't do that. So there are a lot of success stories of black men who are successful as fathers, very successful, very hands-on. But those stories, those images, those messages are not being told through the media. And so we go back to, okay, he didn't have a father, his father was on drugs, his father was in prison. That's not unique to black black boys. But those are the stories that you get on television, the movies, et cetera. And then you got someone like me who gets overprotective, <laughs> somewhat defensive, right? Because, you know, there's so much to our humanity that is not being shown. 
And I, I want to be a part of that change. Okay. So how are you being part of that change? You're speaking, you're writing books, you're collaborating, doing podcasts. So how, how else are you doing? Like, are you, mo- like, you know, you're modeling these behaviors, you know, so. Well, I mean, yeah, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm just one person. <laughs> I'm one person in the role. So I, I'm an author, I'm an educator, I'm an advocate, you know, I'm a humanitarian, you know, um, I, I'm single, no kids. Uh, I have nephews who love what I'm doing. Um, I have a neighbor who has a grandson who's 12 years old. He's Latino. He came to me the other day and said, Mark, um, I'm reading your book and I love it. 12 years old, right? Awesome. That, to me, that's my reward. That's my reward. 12-year-old boy, I don't even know his name, but he's reading my book because he was just diagnosed with ADHD, right? So that's a different lived experience that he's having at a very young age. I don't know how he's coping, but now he has a tool, right? Because there are resources in the book. That's important to me that I can touch the younger generation, right? Because I believe in each one teach one. That's what the Grills taught us. And I could be of service that way anonymously. I'm not trying to be rich or famous. You know, um, if Oprah calls, I'll take her call. <laughs> but my intention is to be of service. And I, I think it's, it's working pretty well so far. Can you talk a bit about some of the tools in your book? Yeah, the tools, you know, I also use the word toy um, because I I think that um, um, it's important to have options, choices, solutions. So um, there are advocates in the book. There are clinicians. There are educators. There are podcasts you can listen to. There are videos you can watch. There are organizations you can connect with. Um, I think that people should know that there's certain things they can do to employ self-care, like exercise, walking, nature, comedy, music, sports, journaling, right? Um, you don't always have to see a professional for your healing. That doesn't have to be the end all, right? Not everyone, it, that's not for everybody. Um, it worked for me, but it, it doesn't work for everyone. But there's so many ways that we can take care of ourselves, that we're not taking care of ourselves. And those are some of the issues that are explored in the book. This is one of the most important questions, whether it's about therapy, about any type of motivation, which is, and I don't know if you can answer this, but have you? how do you find kind of um, helping people bridge the gap between understanding something and then doing? Like, oh, hey, that message made sense. Or, hey, I want to change but how do we translate that into action? Have you found a way to sort of motivate people to get that next step? Well, I mean, honestly, uh, the people who have bought the book and many of them don't look like me, you know, I've had a number of professional women who are seeing black patients. They were very helpful, um, very inspired. I've had older people, older than me, <laughs> who said, I want to give this to my nephew, give this to my son, to my brother. You know, um, so my intention was to be of service and to also break the cycle of generational trauma in my own family and try to build that capacity, you know. Um, But I also have my shortcomings as well. So there's only so much I can do as an individual. You know, you talked about the understanding and the action. You know, I can model my behavior for someone else, but they may not be ready or willing to take that next step. You know, so Mm -hmm. I've had to accept my shortcomings and just kind of get out the way. You know, people call me. We discuss things. I may give them a suggestion. I just may listen. And maybe six months later, say, Mark, you know what? I decided to uh, to go back to the gym. Right. Or I decided to join a support group. or I decided to write a book or whatever they decided to do. And they try to put that into action. And you have other people who just, you know, they're going to be watching football all day. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> everyone's role is different everyone's path is different everyone's journey is different but the best that we can do is the best that we can do and that's all we can do so mark in this uh podcast we we end off every episode with talking to our listeners about what they can do with all this because we we've, we've touched on so many different things uh but we want to leave people with something tangible so i'm wondering your thoughts on 
you know, for, for anyone listening, whether they are a parent of a young man or what if they're, whether they're going through this themselves, what are maybe some first steps that, um, a parents can take of young boys and B what men can do if they're like, okay, you know, maybe it's time for me to do something. What could be a first step? Well, I think a parent can ask their children, is there something on your heart that you would like to share with me? Uh, I think language is really important, you know? Um, where does it hurt? You know? Uh, instead of asking somebody what's wrong, because quite often, if I call you and I say I'm depressed, you may say, well, what's wrong? So now being depressed is wrong. So there's a moral judgment attached to my condition. So we have to find more compassionate, empathetic ways to express ourselves when we talk to our kids, you know? Um, and then introduce them to literature, you know? Or not necessarily my book, but just let them know that they are, there are resources out there that they can use um, to facilitate dialogue, you know? And maybe they might want to consider having a support group once a month for other kids. You know, you invite 10 people over and you give them some food and you sit down for an hour and you just talk. You know, how are you feeling today? What's going on in school? What's going on at home? Right? Um, and the second part of your question, I'm sorry, um, so what can, uh, if a, uh, an adult man is, fi- is listening to this podcast and says, you know what, maybe it's time for me to, to do something about how I've been feeling, what could be a first step, non-threatening step that they could take? Well, I think they can pick up the phone and tell someone that they love and care about, well, I need someone to talk to. Do you have any suggestions? You know, um, they can go online and listen to your podcast. <laughs> I would recommend your podcast, you know. Thank yeah, you. I would, I would, you know, and, and there's so many other podcasts out there where people are talking about mental health. So, and that's something you can do. You don't need a job to listen to a podcast. You have a telephone, right? Most of us have cell phones. We have access to the media, you know, thank God for social media. So you can do that, you know, and you can go online, check out someone's website. You know, like on my website, for example, there's this conversation, there's a documentary, there's an interview, there's a podcast, there's music, there's poetry. So, yeah, just be able to tell someone I need someone to talk to. If you can get that out, especially if it's the truth, and a lot of time it is, I you may not want to talk to somebody, but if you know you need to and you tell somebody that can be that can open that window. Yeah. And of course, my bias is is towards therapy, but I will fully acknowledge what you said before, that it's not accessible for everybody, unfortunately. But I really like the idea of men having strong male relationships in their life where, you know, they can they can watch sports together. They can, you know, go for coffee, but they can also talk about stuff when stuff is really wrong. Um, I think that that is, is significantly lacking uh, with males and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but that's been my observation is that, you know, true, strong male friendships is is really lacking in a lot of lives. Mm, Like deep, deep, emotionally connected friendships. Yeah. 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 I mean, we talk about surface stuff, which is not bad or wrong, but Mm -hmm. we just don't go inside. And again, it it may just take one person who's vulnerable enough to say, you know what? Um, I'm really hurting right now. I feel really sad. I feel really depressed. I feel whatever I feel. And then kind of have that conversation. And that could take years. Yeah. So Mal, Mal and I spend a lot of time talking about like helping, like um, encourage parents to not feel helpless in the face of everything around them, particularly social media, where they say, I'm only one person. So if you had, a, let's say, a parent of a young man uh, or an adolescent male, and, you know, they're saying, what can I do? The social media out there, there's peers, there's influencers. I'm just one person. How can I help my son have a healthier perspective that you're talking about? And they just feel like they've given up. What would you say to that parent? Well, to not give up um, and, and maybe to uh, access some support f- uh, for themselves. You know, maybe they need to pick up the phone and call someone and say, I need someone to talk to. Maybe I can start a support group with, you know, the women in my neighborhood, the women in my building, the women in my job. And we can get together once a month and have a conversation for an hour about what's going on with our kids. You know, you don't you don't necessarily have to go see a professional to do that. So I I really believe in self advocacy. You know, and it, it doesn't necessarily require money or travel or insurance. You just it time, it's sometimes just being creative and imaginative and just being forthright and just you know I need someone to talk to. Can can you come over? Can we sit down? Can we have a conversation? 
you know, have a support group once a month for an hour. You know, get 10 parents, somebody bring some food, and just chop it up. You know, parents know how to talk. <laughs> and they have a lot to talk about. <laughs> and they need a place where they can talk freely without the work, the school, the kids, just amongst parents, their peer group. Any parent can do that, right? And you don't even have to get on social media. You just pick up the phone, call your girlfriend, come over on Saturday at 6 o'clock. I'll cook, right? Um, just come on over. We're going to sit down and we're just going to talk. And that's it. Yeah. And, and Orin and I have talked about that in other contexts before too, like finding like-minded parents who are maybe struggling with some of the same things. Um, we'd be amazed at the, the support we can get from one another. Yeah. I mean, I think people are aching. People have a need to belong, right? And mm -hmm. people have a need to feel safe, to feel appreciated. And those needs can be cultivated by someone with the courage and the foresight to say, let's connect, right? Let's connect, yeah. come over, it's safe, it'll just be us, it won't be recorded. <laughs> no one's watching, you know what I mean? It'll just be us. And you know, and you don't have to get dressed up, you know what I mean? Come in your PJs or whatever. You know, your hair could be messed up. We don't care. Your, your teeth are out of your mouth. We don't care. <laughs> Just come over. We're going to cook. We're going to eat. We're going to talk. And that's what we're going to do. And we'll see what happens. Any parent can do that. Because yeah. um, this is, again, it's, it's going to maybe be an oversimplification, but I hope not. Okay, if I dichotomize it between, and I, th I see this to be the problem in, and Melanie have talked about this a number of times, in younger society today. So if you took anybody who has any of the clear societal disadvantages, like, you know, we, and, and Melanie are clear, we're not black and white, so we're not denying that they exist. So let's say a child has two or three st big strikes against them. They're an adult, a young adult, adolescent, okay? But they've had clear strikes. They've had a hard life and they say to you, or they have that mindset of the mountain's too big. I didn't put it there. Like you said, it's there. I can't climb it. Why would you expect me to climb it? Okay. And then they look at all the other people around them who aren't climbing the mountain either. So someone who's in that mindset of just, as you say, you're into self-advocacy. How do you encourage someone who feels that they don't have that self-agency? How do you get them on that other side of the page? Well, you introduce them to organizations, institutions, resources that are available to them. Uh, when I went to Maine in March, uh, they talked about mentorship, right? Um, I've been a mentor to a young black male for 21 years. And this kid had a horrific story, but we connected. And after three weeks, we were on the phone. We were going to McDonald's. We were talking about the game. And eventually, he began to open up and talk about his hurt, his pain, his trauma. And we cultivated that relationship over a 21 year period. I met him through a community based organization. I didn't know that was going to happen. But because someone suggested that I go to this organization, it's called the Sledge Group in New York. And they have um, mentoring and tutoring for. Uh, Black and brown kids 10 to 18, and their parent or guardian has to attend a monthly support group. And they get paired with a mentor or tutor, and you develop a relationship. Sometimes they last, sometimes they don't. But this individual who was so lost and broken, just like myself, I could identify. I had compassion, I had empathy. We were able to talk. I was able to hear and feel and be there, be present for him without the judgment, right? It's a success story. You know, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, sometimes, again, it's the access. Not everyone has access to information and sometimes information is not culturally progressive. So there's so many layers and battles and, that you have to go through. But, you know, if you stick with somebody long enough and you're resilient and you're persistent and you're determined, and you're loving and kind. You know, you can really help anyone to be the best version of themselves. Yeah, and that word resilience, I think, is really important to, to emphasize here that, um, you know, having resilience in oneself and, and helping to foster that within other people, I think, goes a long way. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, everyone experiences trauma, you know, uh, some more than others. But it's important that people learn resiliency through trauma, that they learn that they can cope, they can heal, they can overcome but they need that space where people are there to assist them through their journey, however that takes place. And I, I want to be that person. Yeah. 
So Mark, thank you for the work that you do. Um, like you said, you're, you're one person, but you're spreading a message that's incredibly important. And, and you know, I'm, I'm sure it's catching on. And again, it's such, um, such an important thing that more men need to to focus on and be comfortable with because it's part of being human, right? It's not about being a male or a female or, or whatever it is. It's about being human and, and being understanding of those emotions. So thank you for the work that you do and for being with us today. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Right. And, so, and I really appreciate it. And it's one thing that, you know, again, Mally, I always promote this idea that more than one thing can be true at once. So uh, while on the one hand, it would be silly to pretend that, you know, certain people, certain backgrounds, certain groups, certain whatever, don't have either other advantages or disadvantages, or hardships, perspectives or whatever that are different from others. At the same time, we can say there are some common factors, some common features in what you've been describing, connecting on an emotional level, meeting somebody where they are, not where you're trying to impose what, what you're trying to impose on them. Right. Having that empathy and compassion, hearing them out, giving them resources. There's universals underneath all the main you know, all the differences. And that's what we, what can unite us is, you know, connecting on those universal levels while also recognizing that my experience, my background, my perspective, whatever might be different from yours, but that shouldn't prevent us from connecting on these other levels. And I, you know, I, I think that message is, you know, is resonating and I think it's really important. And it sounds like that's part of a big part of what you do connecting on that human level, as you said. Yeah. And I agree with you because mental health transcends age, uh, culture, faith, gender, income, orientation, you know, everyone has mental health, right? Our emotional, psychological, social well-being, the way we think, the way we feel, how we deal with stress, the choices we make, we all deal with mental health. It's just now it's actually being expressed. It's being articulated. People are talking about it. and Oh, mental health, what's that? Right? So you have to get past the what's that? And then you have the conversation like we're having now. And people go, oh, okay, that's a real, it's real. 20 years ago, we were not talking about mental health the way we are now, right? Mm -hmm. So we have made some progress. But again, we've been in this country for how long? <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's, there's so much unlearning and relearning. And this is all part of the journey. Mental health is a journey. It's not a destination. There's going to be no championship trophy, no gold medal, no World Cup. <laughs> it's a journey. And that's what I've learned to experience, right? It's the journey. I have days when I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want to check my email, right? And then I have a day like today where I get to talk to you. So every day is different, right? There's a song by Diana Washington, What a Difference a Day Makes. I know you know that song, Orin. You know that song, right? <laughs> what a difference a day makes. A day makes yeah. <laughs> so today is a new day. Let's make it the best day we can. Excellent. Amazing. And you know what, Mally, because normally I sign off with, uh, I say, keep your eyes on the road and your hands upon the wheel. I, I, I was trying to think, how do I turn that into ease on down the road, <laughs> you know, and keep your, keep your hands on the wheel while you ease on down, ease on down that road. So keep your eyes on the road and your hands upon the wheel with good spirit, with, uh, you know, with love in your heart, compassion, and just with the, the, was oh, right. The, the commitment to doing right by others. And I think that you're really embodying that mark. And I really appreciate yes. uh, you, you coming on and, and you spreading that message. So thank, thank you. you. That's, that's what I pray for every day. I ask God to help me to be of service to another human being. That's my intention. Right on. Thank right. you so much, Mark. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. All right. You All too. Right.